In the previous lecture video, we have spoken about the requirements engineering process. We have seen the four important high level activities in the process. The first activity, as we have described, is the feasibility study. So what is feasibility study? A feasibility study is a short focus study that should take place really early in the requirements engineering process. In fact, the requirements engineering process begins with the feasibility study. The aims of a feasibility study are to find out whether the system is worth implementing and if it is worth implementing, can it be implemented given the existing budget and schedule. The input to the feasibility study is a set of preliminary business requirements, an outline description of the system and how the system is intended to support the business processes. The results of a feasibility study should be a report that recommends whether or not it is worth carrying on with the requirements engineering and system development process. It should answer three key questions. First, does the system contribute to the overall objectives? Can the system be implemented within the given schedule and budget using the current technology? Can the system be integrated with other systems that are used? If the answer to any of these questions is no, you should probably not go ahead with the project. If a system does not support the business objectives, it has no real value to the business. While this may seem obvious, many organizations develop systems which do not contribute to their objectives either because they don't have a clear statement of these objectives. Because they fail to define the business requirements for the system, or because other political or organizational factors influence the system procurement. Carrying out a feasibility study involves these three major steps. The first one, information assessment. The second one, information collection. And the third one, report writing. The information assessment phase identifies the information that is required to answer the three questions we just set out in the previous slide. The first one, does the system contribute to overall organizational objectives? Can it be implemented within the budget schedule using current technology? And can it be integrated to communicate with the existing systems that are already in place? Once this information has been identified, you should then question information sources to discover the answers to the next few questions. Examples of the questions that are answered in the information collection phase will include, but are not limited to, how would the organization cope if the system was not implemented at all? What are the problems with current processes and how would the new system that you're developing help alleviate these problems? What direct contributions will the software system make to the business objectives and requirements? Can information be transferred to and from other organizational systems? Does the information require technology that has not been previously used? What must be supported by the system and what need not be supported by the system? Now, information sources may be either managers of departments where the system will be used. They may be software engineers who are familiar with these types of systems, technology experts, end users of the system, etc. Normally, you should try and complete the feasibility study in two or three weeks. The third phase. When all the information is available to you, it is then when you start writing the feasibility study report. You should make a recommendation about whether or not the system development should continue in the report. You may also propose changes to scope, to the budget and schedule of the system and suggest further high level requirements for the system based on your study. So this is about feasibility study. That is the first step in the requirements engineering process. Let's continue. The second step, once you've done the initial feasibility study, is requirements elicitation and analysis. In this activity, the software engineers work with customers and system end users to find out about the application domain, what services the system will provide, the required performance of the system 
and hardware constraints and other constraints on the working and building of the system. Requirements elicitation and analysis may involve a variety of different kinds of people in an organization. So who are these people? These people are called stakeholders. A system stakeholder is anyone who should have some direct or indirect influence on the system requirements. Stakeholders will include end users who will interact with the system and anyone else in the organization who will be affected by the system. Other stakeholders also might be engineers who are developing or maintaining other related systems, business managers who may take strategic decisions for the organization, domain experts, trade union representatives, and so on. Take a look at the diagram here on the left-hand side of the slide. This is the requirements elicitation and analysis process. The first step, so this is nothing but a process model of the elicitation and analysis process. The process activities are described or defined here. The first activity is called as requirements discovery. Let's study what requirements disco discovery is. This is the process of interacting with stakeholders of the system to discover their requirements. Domain requirements from stakeholders and documentation are also discovered during this activity. There are several complementary techniques which we will study in detail in the upcoming videos. The second step, requirements classification and organization. This activity takes the unstructured collection of requirements, groups, related requirements, and organizes them into coherent clusters. The most common way of grouping requirements is to use a model of the system architecture to identify subsystems and to associate requirements with each of the subsystems. In practice, requirements engineering and architectural design cannot be completely separate activities. Let's go to the third step, requirements prior prioritization and negotiation. Let's define what this is. When multiple stakeholders are involved, requirements will definitely conflict. This activity, the third activity, is concerned with prioritizing requirements and finding and resolving requirements conflicts through negotiation between different stakeholders. Usually, stakeholders have to meet to resolve differences and agree upon compromise requirements. The last step, requirement specification. The requirements are documented and input to the next round of the spiral. We have seen the spiral of the requirement engineering process in the previous lecture video. So in the last step, this is where you document the final requirements after arriving at a consensus in case you had a conflict between stakeholders. And this will provide input or this will serve as input to the next spiral. Formal or informal requirements documents will be produced here. The requirements elicitation and analysis is an iterative process with continual feedback from each activity to the others. The process cycle starts with requirements discovery as shown in the figure and ends with the requirements documentation or the requirements specification. The analyst understanding of the requirements improves with each round of the cycle. The cycle finally ends when the requirement document is satisfactorily complete. Now, elicitating and uh, uh, understanding requirements from system stakeholders is a difficult task. What are the challenges with this process of requirements elicitation and al analysis? Let's take a look at that. Firstly, stakeholders often do not know what they want from the computer system, except in the most generic terms, because they may not be technical people. They may find it difficult to articulate what they want the system to do. They may make unrealistic demands because they don't know what the system is and they don't know if having such a system or implementing such a system is feasible or not. Second, stakeholders in a system naturally express requirements in their own terms and with implicit knowledge of their work. Requirement engineers, on other hand, with, without being experienced in the customer's domain, may not understand the customer's requirement. Thirdly, Different stakeholders have different set of requirements, and they may express these different requirements in their own way or in different ways. 
requirements engineers have to discover all potential sources of requirements and then discover commonalities and conflicts and arrive at consensus, especially when you have contradictory requirements. Political factors. Political factors may influence the requirements of a system. Managers may make demands on specific system requirements because these may allow them to increase their influence in the organization and outside of the organization. Next, dynamic economic and business environment. Now, the economic and business environment in which the requirements analysis takes place is dynamic. It inevitably changes during the analysis process. The importance of one particular requirement will change. Something that was important some time back will no longer be important or relevant. New requirements may emerge and so on, because even new stakeholders may be attached with the organization who were not originally consulted. So these are the challenges involved or which uh, a requirements engineer will have to face and solve during the requirements elicitation and analysis process. Inevitably, different stakeholders have different viewpoints. And if these viewpoints are conflicting, it's difficult because you have to organize regular stakeholder negotiations so that you can compromise and arrive at consensus. It is impossible to completely satisfy every stakeholder. But if some stakeholders feel totally left out or they have not been properly considered, then they may deliberately attempt to undermine the requirements engineering process. The requirements that have been elicited so far will have to be document in, documented in such a way that they can be used to help the requirements. At this stage, an early version of the requirements document may be produced with some missing sections and incomplete requirements set. Alternatively, the requirements may be documented in a completely different way, that is, maybe on spreadsheets or on story cards and so on. Writing requirements on cards can be really effective as these are easy for stakeholders to handle, change, and organize. So in this lecture video, we saw the first two steps. The first one is the feasibility study of the requirement engineering process. The second step was the requirements elicitation and analysis. We have seen only a high level or a superficial broad view of the requirements elicitation and the analysis process. We are going to talk about each of these phases, that is requirements discovery in particular, the specification, validation of all these requirements in detail in the upcoming lectures. Thank you.